Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Connecticut Green Bank's quarterly stakeholder webinar. Uh, we will be getting started in just a few minutes while everyone signs on. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for the Connecticut Green Bank's quarterly stakeholder webinar. Uh, joining us today are Brian Garcia, President and CEO of the Connecticut Green Bank, Carrie O'Neill, CEO of Inclusive Prosperity Capital, and Ben Healy, President of Inclusive Prosperity Capital. Um, our agenda today is to discuss the Connecticut Green Bank's performance and impact over fiscal year 2018, as well as a formal introduction to inclusive prosperity capital. Uh, so uh, just a couple items. Please send in questions using the question box as we go, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to Brian Garcia for sector updates. All right. Great. Good afternoon. Thank you all for uh, spending your lunchtime with us today here on this late August afternoon. Um, we're going to start off with just providing an update on the end of fiscal year 2018 with regards to our various sectors. Uh, then we're going to provide a, an overall fiscal year performance uh, to targets. Uh, we're going to do some follow-up on some green bank impact reporting, uh, just taking some of the uh, measurable impacts that we've done and talk a little bit more about them. Uh, and then I'm going to get to introduce uh, Carrie O'Neill, who you all know, and Ben Healy, uh, who you all know, of Inclusive Prosperity Capital. So uh, really excited uh, to do that. Um, so let's just jump in, um, Ed, Andrea, to the uh, infrastructure slide. Um, one more. So yeah, just starting us off here, uh, just to provide you all with some context. So there are really three key metrics that our team is after uh, in any given year when we establish uh, with our board our fiscal year budget and targets. Uh, the three key metrics that we're setting are uh, capital deployed, uh, the amount of public and private investment that's going into Connecticut's clean energy economy, and, and that's important because that ultimately leads to jobs, leads to tax revenue generation, and all the things that we want to see uh, thriving economies deliver. Uh, we also focus on uh, capacity of renewable energy, uh, as well as energy efficiency uh, and other clean energy resources. And it's important that as you get more deployment, 
you start to see your environmental protection benefits and your public health benefits. Again, we're going to go into some of these metrics here in a second. And then our third metric is around number of projects. So it's really important that we reach a number of families and businesses to reduce peak demand on the grid. So it's really helping to improve the overall uh, reliability of the grid. So that's why we call it the infrastructure sector. Uh, but you can see overall uh, that we had a great year, uh, over $180 million of capital deployed, uh, nearly uh, deploying 50 megawatts of residential uh, solar PV. Uh, we've used uh, about $14 million of our resources to support of the deployment of that residential solar PV. Uh, and you'll hear me talk a little bit later, and you heard us talk about it at the last quarterly webinar, where we get cost recovery from supporting this incentive program. So I'll talk about that uh, in a bit. Um, and you can see that we've had nearly 6,000 projects. Um, all of these projects also include a home energy assessment. So when you think about energy efficiency, uh, we feel it's very, very important to bring solar PV together with energy efficiency. So working with our utility partners, uh, we've been able to have each home participating in this solar program also uh, support energy efficiency. Okay, so as we transition here to uh, the residential sector, uh, we've really got a, a number of different financing products here. Uh, Carrie and Ben are going to go into more detail as these are going to be uh, the products that Inclusive Prosperity Capital is going to be um, leading and administering uh, on behalf of the Green Bank here in the state of Connecticut. But for the most part, there are a couple of products uh, in this sector that are focused on single family and multifamily uh, financing. Uh, the first one is uh, Posigen. Uh, this is a partnership that we have uh, with this company to offer a solar PV lease and an energy efficiency ESA uh, for low to moderate income single family households. Uh, I'll go into detail into a, in a second. Um, a Smarty Loan, we, we currently partner with a number of community banks and credit unions to offer what I like to say is our comprehensive energy strategy policy product. You know, Connecticut has a really aggressive uh, CES, and this is a product that provides low cost, a long-term financing for homeowners that want to uh, support energy efficiency, renewable energy, natural gas conversions. Uh, if there are pre-existing health and safety issues in the home, then the, this sort of financing can help uh, to ameliorate uh, those issues. So that's the Smarty Loan. And then we also have a great portfolio of multifamily affordable housing uh, loan products as well that are doing really well. So overall, we had a, an exceptional year when it comes to our residential sector. Um, in Smarty, we had a really great year. We had over about $35 million uh, worth of investment going into uh, this product uh, over this year. About 1,750 projects, um, a majority of those being uh, efficient HVAC and energy efficiency. So it's really great uh, to see households uh, out and about uh, looking at a clean energy and helping them reduce the burden of energy costs by working with their local community bank and credit union, as well as their local contractor to deliver those resources to them. So Smarty Loan had an exceptional year. Uh, Posigen, uh, we also saw over $15 million of investment uh, through our solar PV lease and energy efficiency ESA with Posigen. What's also exciting about that product is that about two thirds of the households that participated in the solar lease also decided that it was important to go deeper on energy efficiency and took the offer of the energy savings agreement. 
So households are clearly expressing a preference to want to do both uh, solar PV and energy efficiency. And this financial innovation that combines both of them is able to deliver that to households. And then our multifamily line of pro projects, uh, we had a number of uh, uh, investments uh, in this space. We invested over $25 million in 11 different projects that are serving over 1,700 units. So again, it's really important that uh, we enable uh, clean energy to be deployed on all our single family and multifamily households. And as we know, by deploying more clean energy, we're helping to reduce the burden of energy costs on those families. So it's great to see uh, the performance in our residential sector. Um, what we're also very, very proud about is that uh, we've been able to see residential solar PV become more affordable and accessible to all income classes. Um, one of the things that we did back in um, December of 2014 was we worked with the University of Connecticut on a study that looked at the deployment of rooftop solar in Connecticut, and clearly the findings were telling us that we were failing to reach low to moderate income households. Um, from that time, our team worked really, really hard to turn things around. And the progress today, as you can see, uh, and more recently reported out in the spring by LBNL, is Connecticut is one of four states to reach parity when it comes to residential solar PV. That is to say that the proportion of households in low to moderate income communities are receiving the same amount of solar PV as non low to moderate income households. And in fact, you can see the updated data that LBNL study, I think, went through the end of 2016. Uh, this data here goes through the middle of 2018. So you could actually see that we are beyond parity and our team was working really, really hard to continue to demonstrate that uh, residential solar PV uh, can be uh, taken up by um, all uh, income classes. And that's really important because when you think about the energy burden or the energy affordability gap for low to moderate income households, the more they save, the more they can invest in their families. Proportionally, saving energy to them is much more important than non-LMI uh, households that are located in non-LMI communities. And this is just here just to say, uh, having recently read the encyclical, that you know, you can't have ecology without a, an appropriate anthropology. And, and what Pope Francis is saying there is that to address our environmental issues, we're also going to have to address our fundamental humanitarian issues. And uh, by enabling low to moderate income households to have access to solar PV, we are helping them reduce the burden of energy costs and uh, realize greater potential uh, in our societies. Uh, next slide. All right, so just kind of wrapping up our sectors here with the CNI sector. Um, this really was our best year when it came to uh, commercial property assessed clean energy, CPACE. Uh, we had the most projects this year, 66 projects and over $25 million uh, of investment to support clean energy on uh, small businesses, office spaces, nonprofits. Manufacturers. Manufacturers are our largest uh, customer in this program. Um, and I just really want to acknowledge the number of private investment partners that we have in the market who are offering CPACE financing, Greenworks Lending, uh, Hannon. small businesses use this product to effectively reduce their energy costs. Um, we've seen uh, some pretty dramatic uh, energy cost reductions uh, from what these uh, end users were paying before to what they're now paying after through the Green Bank Solar PPA. So uh, an, again, another great uh, performance here from the CNI sector uh, of the Green Bank. All right, so let's Let's just kind of wrap up the, the year end here and just provide an overall view. Now, you all realize that it was a very tough year. We had the uh, sweeps back in the fall of last year that uh, put a 
a significant had a significant impact on both us and our colleagues uh, at the Connecticut uh, Energy Efficiency Fund. Um, but overall, we had a, a great year. You know, we helped nearly 7,500 families and businesses reduce the burden of energy costs by deploying nearly 60 megawatts of renewable energy and investing $260 million in the state's green economy. That is an extraordinary number. It's one of our best that we've put up uh, over the course of our seven years. When you look at the $33.5 million of investment by the Green Bank, that's in a number of things. That's direct investment through our financing products. That's through incentives that get recovered. That's through credit enhancements on loss reserves and interest rate buy-downs with our various partners. But you can see that we achieved our best leverage ratio yet overall with all our products together uh, in fiscal year 2018 at an eight to one leverage ratio. So it was a very, very uh, productive year uh, despite the setbacks uh, from the sweeps in the fall of last year. All right, so, so what does this all mean when we, we look at uh, the Green Bank's performance since its inception in July of 2011? So I wanna go through a couple of things. Let's start off with uh, investment. Um, and you all might recall if you attended the last stakeholder webinar that Eric Schrago, our Director of Operations, presented a number of different methodologies that we have been working on with various state agencies, uh, federal agencies. And what you're seeing here is effectively our, what we call our data warehouse or how we've collected data on the different projects that we've supported and turned all that data into the societal profit or the benefits that society is achieving receiving as a result of more clean energy deployment. It all starts with investment at the top. Our focus is to use the limited public resources that we receive to mobilize more private investment in Connecticut's green energy economy. So $1.3 billion mobilized of investment in Connecticut's economy since uh, the start of fiscal year 2012, which was July 1st of 2011. Uh, overall, we've achieved a leverage ratio of six to one that's to say for every one public dollar we've used or invested from the green bank, we receive $6 of private investment. Uh, this is when people think of green banks, they typically think of the leverage ratio, which is trying to get more, uh, a lot more out of your limited public dollars. Um, and from all that investment, uh, we've generated uh, quite a bit of tax revenues, um, whether that's individual income tax from all the jobs that are created, the construction jobs, all the people who are out in our communities installing clean energy, to the corporate taxes being paid, all of those companies that are manufacturing or installing clean energy that are paying state taxes, all the way to sales taxes. We have uh, quite a bit of sales tax revenue coming into the state despite a number of our renewable energy resources being exempt from sales tax. So uh, we've had about $60 million in state tax revenues coming in uh, to Connecticut's economy as a result of $1.3 billion of investment over the course of the last seven years. All right, so let's move to uh, economic development. So I was hinting at this a little bit with regards to the jobs. Uh, so all of the investment going into these clean energy projects has helped create about 16,000 direct, indirect, and induced jobs. Uh, we worked closely with the Department of Economic and Community Development to develop a methodology for job creation. Uh, on the tax revenue generation uh, that I just noted, we worked with the Department of Revenue Services on that methodology. So we're working really closely with our uh, state agency partners to develop reasonable estimates of the societal benefits coming from more clean energy deployment. Um, and with regards to uh, reducing the energy burden on families and businesses, you know, over 30,000 families and businesses have uh, reduced their energy burden by installing clean energy. That is great. Uh, we also want to make sure that low to moderate income households have uh, clean energy, that it's uh, more accessible and affordable to them as well. And as I just mentioned, we've been making a steady progress to ensure uh, that our contractors, our capital providers are putting resources out to support uh, households in low to moderate income communities. So it's great to see. Um, all right, and let's just kind of wrap up our little Green Bank impact report with environmental protection. Um, so all of the clean energy that is deployed, whether it's zero emission 
uh, renewable energy like solar and wind or low emission like fuel cells or energy efficiency um, all lead to the reduction of air emissions. And we work with the US EPA as well as DEEP, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection in our Department of Public Health to develop methodologies around estimating the environmental and public health benefits with more clean energy generation. And you can see here that we've reduced a significant amount of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, also particulate matter um, that lead to improvements in public health, uh, reduced hospitalizations, uh, reduced sick days, and even death. Um, so we have calculators now that allow us to understand the benefits of reducing air pollution and what that translates uh, into in terms of public health. Um, so we are going to include this Green Bank Impact Report as part of our follow-up to this webinar uh, so you all can see difficulties with GoToWebinar, the audio keeps uh, keeps cutting out. So apologies for, for everyone on the line. Would you mind just going over that slide one more time? Perfect. I will. Will do. So on the so I'm really optimistic about the future of clean energy in Connecticut. Um, what I was referring to was that there is, you know, there are changes on the horizon. We've got the elections coming up, uh, but there are a number of policies that passed uh, last year that are really supportive of the expansion of clean energy, whether that's the renewable portfolio, the doubling of the renewable portfolio standard, or the setting of the midterm gr uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction target uh, to 45% below 2001 levels by the year 2030. Um, there's really, I'm, I'm really optimistic about what that means to the future and the decarbonization of the electric grid and moving our vehicle, uh, our vehicle emissions to the grid, our renewable heating and cooling emissions from propane and, and heating oil to a, a zero carbon grid. So uh, that's all to say I'm just really optimistic about what the future holds for Connecticut. And we want to see uh, more investment coming into Connecticut. We know more investment leads to all of those uh, exciting things that I was mentioning uh, just before on the Green Bank Impact Report. All right. So, so with that kind of context of how we did over the course of the last year um, and how we performed over the course of the last seven years with the Green Bank. I want to transition here a bit and um, come back to uh, come back to where we left off last time um, when we were talking about the Green Bank and it's uh, how we were managing through uh, the legislative uh, sweeps. Um, so we talked last time about the two businesses that the Green Bank runs. Uh, we run an incentive business, which is, I was talking earlier about the infrastructure sector. Uh, that business is cost recovered, which is to say we support incentives to homeowners, uh, but we get those resources um, recovered by selling renewable energy credits uh, to our utility partners uh, through a master purchase agreement. And in the coming months, we're going to be uh, issuing a securitization, a green bond, uh, that uh, the capital markets hopefully will buy up and will allow us to continue to support uh, this growing and thriving market. Uh, we also run an investment business, which is a clean energy finance business, and we've got a number of uh, projects and, and products that uh, we're supporting there. And our focus there is to really achieve uh, self-sustainability. 
which is to deliver a, a rate of return on each transaction that we invest in so that over time uh, we break even as an organization. That's to say that the interest income from those investments covers the operating expenses uh, for administering those programs. Um, so those are the two really key business units that the Green Bank uh, operates. But I'm excited now to, to introduce uh, Inclusive Prosperity Capital, uh, who is our partner that's going to be implementing effectively programs that we spent a lot of time building over the course of the last four to five years uh, in underserved markets and underserved credits. And for the Green Bank, this is going to help us uh, with operating leverage. It's going to help us reduce our OPEX. Uh, it's going to continue to deliver the social return that we want to see in Connecticut uh, by driving in more investment uh, into Connecticut. Uh, the legislative sweeps had a significant impact on our ability to attract private investment. And through the creation of inclusive prosperity capital, uh, we're now seeing private investment come back through an independent nonprofit. So there are a couple of stories, uh, and I'm just going to link these uh, two stories. You, you can uh, uh, access them later if you're interested. But Matt Pylon with the Hartford Business Journal did an excellent job uh, speaking to and addressing, covering the story of how the Green Bank addressed the legislative sweeps back in the latter part of last year. Um, so his January 8th story is really great. He did a comprehensive job on how we went about setting a sustainability plan uh, for uh, the Green Bank managing through those sweeps. And then he recently covered uh, our board meeting of July 27th, uh, where he covered uh, the board's approval and support of the uh, contracts for inclusive prosperity capital. And uh, with that, I am not going to steal any thunder. I'm simply going to introduce uh, Kerry O'Neill, uh, the CEO, and Ben Healy, the president uh, of Inclusive Prosperity Capital, to take it from here. Thank you, Brian. It's it's thrilling to be here in our new roles. It's always good, you know, which it's not like um, we haven't been here before, but to come here um, as Inclusive Prosperity Capital is really thrilling for um, Ben and myself um, and to talk, every, talk to everyone about what it is that we're doing um, with this nonprofit uh, venture with the Green Bank and deep support. So I think Inclusive Prosperity Capital, it's, it's a new type of financial intermediary in the market where we're really operating at that intersection of community development, those underserved markets that we've been talking about, and energy finance and climate impacts. And we're building on a foundation of success here in Connecticut We've already mobilized $360 million in this intersection um, of investment in underserved communities, unconventional credits, low to moderate income communities. And we know we have an amazing opportunity in front of us here in Connecticut. There's so much more still to do here in Connecticut. But we also know these strategies that we pioneered here at the Green Bank. Uh, there are a lot of other markets that can benefit from them. And many folks have been coming to us over the years saying, you know, um, can you teach us about these products? Can you brought, bring these products to us? And so um, we see that great opportunity to not only serve Connecticut, but to serve other markets as well. And I think, Ben, you know, maybe you could talk for a moment about, you know, from a capitalization and capital raising standpoint, what is it that capital providers, you know, see and are excited about when we think about inclusive prosperity capital? Well, well what's not to love? Um, in all seriousness, uh, glad to be with the team, glad to be with everyone on the call today and excited about this new venture, which I really describe as an extension of Green Bank infrastructure. This is a way to continue the mission um, in a independent but closely aligned way um, that benefits from the kind of scale that IPC can bring to investing in Connecticut and beyond. I think from a capital provider perspective, what, what folks are really excited about in these conversations is the proof of success from the Green Bank model, the ability to work within an established set of products and with partners, many of whom are on this call, that have a, a really a track record of delivering quality projects um, that are financeable. And for IPC, to, to do what we've always said uh, is the Green Bank mission, uh, crowd in 
the kind of capital that is looking for opportunities to invest in this sector. Uh, all too often, it's the, the challenge is not a lack of capital. It is really connecting project demand with capital supply and doing so in a way that's scalable. The scale opportunity here is uh, really to the benefit of Connecticut by thinking more broadly, operating at a larger level, being able to build fund structures that can work both locally, regionally, and beyond gives us the uh, the, the tools really to be able to uh, bring in the lower cost capital, which is going to continue to be um, critical in a rising interest rate environment. Working through a nonprofit, we can attract some of the uh, mission-aligned capital that um, help will help uh, build uh, more complicated capital stacks by serving in a risk position and, and really um, taking some of that uh, alongside IPC. And um, working with everyone from investors, banks that might be motivated by Community Reinvestment Act considerations to impact investors, foundations, as well as traditional, uh, all the players that we brought to the table, tax equity and the like, um, it just creates flexibility um, in an uncertain political environment. And while I agree with um, Brian Garcia's overall optimism, it is good to have a hedge and IPC in some ways serves as that hedge, uh, allowing us to continue this work. So let me leave it with that, but I think um, we're starting off in a, in a great place uh, with a lot of support and excitement because the Green Bank model has shown such promise um, and we can build from there. And Ben, will you take us through the, the fund launch kind of particulars for folks? Sure, just the quick high level is here on this uh, on this slide, but as of uh, August 3rd, um, you know, Carrie and I and a few others from the Green Bank, a core group of skilled uh, members of the Green Bank team, we got our we got our walking papers uh, from the Green Bank and the uh, same day started up over at IPC. Um, the key uh, it's worth acknowledging is that uh, thanks to the leadership of Commissioner Cleat Deep and others on his team with support of a lot of folks, uh, there's an initial uh, approximately six, six and a half million dollars of um, funds that Deep is granting to the Green Bank for the purposes of launching IPC, critical base of equity to be used only in Connecticut. Uh, to target the uh, ex exactly these projects and the kinds of investments um, that Carrie will, will dive into in a second. Um, we believe with that uh, capital on the equity side, we are putting together the uh, debt side of the balance sheet, <coughs> excuse me, right now. Um, a combination of support from the Kresge Foundation uh, in a leadership role, uh, Hewlett as well, and then in negotiations now with Calvert Impact Capital, a mission-aligned investment uh, lender, uh, to raise another 14, 15 million. So that $20 million really comes with a Kresge um, guarantee supporting a uh, anticipated Calvert debt investment, and that Calvert money will be both for Connecticut and beyond, and will serve as the initial base towards another 50 plus million uh, that we anticipate putting together this year. Uh, based on the investors that we've been talking to. So a whole lot of runway there. Um, as I mentioned, uh, those who got our walking papers, it's Carrie leading leading this uh, this group into the into the new uh, great beyond. Um, and then uh, I'll just quickly name them because uh, folks uh, it's a small enough state that folks know each other. Um, we've got me, Ben Healy, Chris McGallis from the finance team, and then on our residential program team, um, John D'Agostino from the multifamily side, Joe Bonanata and Madeline Priest on the single family side, along with Liz Johnson, uh, providing key support throughout. And so it's a great team starting this off and a key consideration for uh, investors as well as those looking to partners looking to work with us is that the Green Bank um, and IPC have effectively signed a series of long-term contracts uh, really going out uh, a full six years with some step downs, but a commitment on behalf of IPC to make sure these products continue to uh, succeed in Connecticut. So effectively, um, this team taking our skills and, and putting it to work on behalf of the Green Bank, and in return, the Green Bank supporting inclusive prosperity capital so that it has a, uh, a launching pad for growth, both within the state and, um, 
and more broadly as we bring those benefits back home. I think, Carrie, let me turn it back to you. Yeah, thanks, Ben. And so let me just go through the product areas. Brian's touched on them, um, but just so everybody's aware of you know what's being outsourced in Connecticut, but also the opportunities beyond. So first, um, when we think about our investment opportunities in LMI solar, low to moderate income residential solar, um, Posigen has been our marquee investment here in the state of Connecticut, and we see a great opportunity to continue that not only in Connecticut and but uh, beyond as well. And I think one of the key things that sets our team apart versus other folks out in the market is we've really come to understand the credit profile of low to moderate income residential solar. We're not scared by it. We understand how to talk to investors about that and structure and make them comfortable so that products like Posigen can come into markets like Connecticut and generate all these great jobs and lowering of energy burden. Um, some, it just within Connecticut, some of the additional thing that, things that the Inclusive Prosperity Capital team will be doing on behalf of the Green Bank is continuing to support low-income uh, initiatives, things like our Connecticut Green and Healthy Homes uh, project that we partner with Department of Public Health and many, many, many other uh, stakeholders on. So that will be continuing um, in terms of Connecticut. Next product, our Green Bank Solar PPA. Brian talked about this. This is um, you know, a product that we really love because it's serving a part of the market that not a lot of other folks are, are paying attention to and that really benefit from solar. Um, this is, in particular, uh, uh, housing authorities. It could be houses of worship, nonprofits. Uh, municipal uh, buildings, schools, firehouses, town buildings, uh, community centers, things of the like, and, and small to medium and commercial as well. And so we'll be providing administrative support to the Green Bank for the existing commercial solar PPA. Um, but we're also going to be, uh, Ben and, and Chris are in the process of raising a new solar fund that will benefit not only Connecticut, but that can be used outside of Connecticut as well. And I think this is exciting for our developer partners we already work with in Connecticut. We know are working in other states. They've come to know and like us and this product, so we can now support them elsewhere. But also thinking about our Green Bank brothers and sisters, you know, they've um, expressed a lot of interest in a product like this um, because, again, there's just not a lot of folks in the market that are paying attention to this part of the market that's really, truly underserved. So very excited about this uh, product. Um, affordable mostly family housing, um, that suite of programs and approaches um, that you know, had a great year this year. Um, this includes pre-development support um, as well as term financing in Connecticut. Um, Capital for Change has been our partner um, on the Lime Loan. Um, Housing Development Fund has been our partner on um, the MacArthur Foundation PRI dollars and administering our pre-development and Catalyst Loan. And so all of that will continue in Connecticut. But importantly, with the deep capital grants in particular being able to support multifamily in Connecticut, we can also raise additional funds that can help uh, keep pre-development and catalyst uh, uh, programs in the Connecticut market as the MacArthur Foundation dollars, um, those $5 million are almost fully deployed. So really great opportunity to keep this product set in the market when we had, you know, the, the sweeps happen, and this, this was a real concern. How were we going to keep these products in the market? We're able to do that now, as well as achieve scale here and bring these programs to other markets as well. Last is our Smarty Loan Program, which Brian talked about had a really amazing year uh, this year, thanks to some ERA dollars that we were able to support um, in the market with a great special offer, um, which led to some great market transformation. This is, this is a program that has a 20 to 1 leverage ratio, a little bit of public dollars, a lot of private investment coming through our CDFI partners, our community banks, and credit union partners. Um, but this is a pro product, you know, residential lending is a product, uh, an area of the market that really requires a lot of scale, and Connecticut's a small market. Um, and so we have a great opportunity with our colleagues in Michigan, Michigan Saves, to partner together on program design and bring some more scale to this program, not only benefiting Connecticut, but bringing this program model to other parts of the country that want to also see their local lenders and local contractors doing um, energy and re you know renewable energy and energy efficiency lending. Um, we've 
got great support from the Hewlett Foundation, uh, Michigan Saves and, can, and Inclusive Prosperity Capital uh, went after a grant to help us de develop a whole new online platform that will drive some of that scale and efficiency needed in this product. Um, so we're very, very excited about the opportunities um, in this product as well. And then I guess last, I think, you know, for everybody, it's like, well, what does this mean for me here in Connecticut? What does this mean for these products? Um, you know, you heard Ben talk about, you know, this is a, a piece of Green Bank infrastructure. This, this is very much a collaboration with the Connecticut Green Bank, with DEEP, to keep these specific products, these four programs here in the Connecticut market. We're outsourcing the administration, but these are still Green Bank products. They're still on the website, all the branding and the marketing and everything stays the same. In terms of the daily operations, no impact to those of you that we work with on a daily basis. Same phone numbers, the Connecticut Green Bank email addresses still work, the same processes, same loan approvals for Smart E, for multifamily, um, for commercial solar PPAs. So I think that's really the, the primary message we want to leave uh, the Connecticut folks on the phone with is that um, these products are, are here to stay for the long term. Um, they're, the program designs are staying the same. You have the same great folks um, supporting you. Um, some of them may work for the Green Bank. Some of them may work for Inclusive Prosperity Capital, but you can reach them um, the same way you always have. And I think I think with that, Brian, those are um, those are all the things that we wanted to cover. Or Ben, I don't know if there's anything else uh, that I missed that you want to um, uh, chime in with. No, I think no? Uh, you covered it off, Mary. And uh, yeah, what I would I think what I'd say by way of closing as well is um, this new entity uh, creates a level of flexibility um, that we've always tried to have in the in, in the green bank world, but um, again, gives us, gives us another set of tools. And so if there is uh, something you out there, someone out there with, with a, a product structure or concept you've been, you've been itching to try, uh, the door is open. The door has always been open at the Green Bank, but um, certainly uh, this is a chance to imagine new possibilities. And the same holds true on the investor side. Um, I know uh, some folks are, are on this webinar and are part of the conversation broadly. Um, this this intermediary is filling a gap. It is very clear that this kind of um, structure um, is new to the market, comes with, comes with a set of risks, but also a real set of opportunities to take lessons learned and um, take them to the next level. And that's exactly what, what we're trying to do. So I think in, in closing, um, certainly for this section of the webinar, I want to leave with, with that thought of uh, the chance for new possibilities that this brings and to continue the good work. So um, disruption uh, to some extent, uh, continuity to uh, another, bit, uh, another bit, but that uh, combination is, is where we're going to find something special. Great. Thank you, Carrie and Ben, for that introduction and overview of IPC, Inclusive Prosperity Capital. That was great. All right, Ed, return it over to you. All right, uh, so um, now is the time. If anyone has any questions, please, we encourage you to use the question and answer box here, and we'll answer them for you. Um, if there's anything that you'd like to follow up with us separately on, um, feel free to send us an email, and we can get back to you on that. Um, so I've got a couple coming in here. Uh, I'll get to the, the first one, um, which came in <laughs> the second we started. It's about net metering. <laughs> um, so uh, this question is, can installers be assured that RCIP approved clients will all be grandfathered in until the demise of that program? Can they be assured that no interim tariff um, will be imposed on anyone? Great. So, so for all of you um, behind the meter contractors in Connecticut and those who aren't, uh, Connecticut's going through a transition from net metering to a two tariff structure, a buy all, sell all structure, or a use buy cell um, structure. Um, yes, you can be assured that all RCIP supported projects, that is those projects that fall underneath the Green Bank's residential solar investment program up through 300 megawatts will have net metering grandfathered uh, 20 years beyond uh, the year 20, uh, I think it's 2039 it goes till. Up until 2039. Uh, up until 2039. Um, so you, they're grandfathered in. So that's that's great. 
Um, I would also say that there's currently a regulatory process happening that is interpreting the statute that is Public Act 18-50, specifically Section 7, which is where all of this transition language is. So there's a regulatory proceeding at Pura, the Public Utility Regulatory Authority, where everyone is talking about debating all the different pieces on how we're going to implement this transition. Um, we'd be happy to meet with the residential contractors through Solar Connecticut, through you directly. I can tell you that our team is actively engaged in that process. We just submitted our second set of comments yesterday, a very comprehensive set of information. I think we included 10 exhibits, probably took the page limit above 300 pages. So we're very actively valuing uh, the benefits that solar PV creates. You know, I spoke earlier about the environmental benefits. We're valuing the CO2 benefits. We're valuing the, the particulate matter benefits. We're valuing the public health benefits. We want to see low to moderate income households have access to solar PV, given what we've been able to provide. Uh, we're trying to create additional adders for supporting uh, the reduction of peak demand on the grid. Um, so, yeah, we're very actively involved. You should feel confident that our team is on it. Uh, but I would also suggest that uh, if you're a part of the industry, that you should reach out as well to your industry group, whether that's REBA on the commercial side or Solar Connecticut on the residential side. Thanks, Brian. Um, and so I think this question was mostly answered by your last answer, but um, so if, if there's no further comment, you don't uh, need to go into any further detail, but the um, the question is here about sort of what the Green Bank uh, plans to do to help transition installers and the market off of EPBBs and PBIs into the new tariff. Great. So, so I'll just continue. Yes. Like the, so what's currently being discussed is um, by statute, uh, there's the ability to create an interim tariff before these two tariffs take effect. Um, the Green Bank is taking a position of trying to get that interim tariff established uh, some, at some rate uh, by the end of this calendar year. And then hopefully in the first quarter of next year, we would start to see that interim tariff be a third option for contractors to provide the customers. It's our hope that that interim tariff option will be no less will have no less value than the current RCIP. In fact, we want to see it have more value so that contractors are able to sell uh, the interim tariff option to customers. Our, our focus is to really help the market transition from where we are today to where the policy is heading, and the interim tariff is front and center what we're focused on completely. Uh, we will make it a point to send out our comments through this uh, webinar that we've submitted to Pura uh, that shows that our focus is the interim tariff. Um, there are some general concerns we're raising on the actual tariff itself. Uh, it would appear that the metering and billing systems that the uh, current electric distribution companies have uh, isn't able to implement the netting interval requirements that the policy requires. So everything less than daily uh, netting for folks who are following the policy. So there's a bit of a debate happening now at the regulator uh, at Pura around what's going to happen if the systems aren't ready to handle the metering systems, the billing systems aren't ready to handle this transition. And that's a, a debate we're actively involved in. Thanks, Brian. Um, so just a couple other questions here just about um, providing the uh, presentation and contact info for folks at, IC, or at IPC. So uh, we have that on the next slide here. So we will provide um, a copy of the presentation and contact info as well as some other items when we send this out uh, as well as the recording. So uh, if there are no further questions, uh, that will conclude today's webinar. So thanks everyone for joining. And again, remember if you have any other questions after the fact, you can always send us an email. Thank you. Thanks all.